Welcome to Al Skate Club. On today's Skate Club, we go back to 1990 for the top 10 DOS games of that year. 1990 was a year of two halves. On one hand, it brought change. Hercules, CGA and even EGA graphics were almost completely relegated overnight. For the new kid in town, VGA, with its 256 colour palette, and most games had digitised sound, in one form or another. However, for all of this, on the other hand, the games in 1990 were, in my opinion, not as plentiful as 1989 was. It was nigh on impossible to choose a top 25 for 1989, let alone a top 10. 1990 had between 10 to 15 classic hits. So accepting some huge bangers, which you're about to see, 1990 really was that year of two halves. A little of Ratum from my last video, I put Prince of Persia in the top 10, although it was released on some platforms in 1989, it wasn't on the PC till 1990, so consider that one in here too. Let's get on with the show. In at number 10 then is Sid Meier's Railroad Tycoon. This one is for all you train geeks out there. And that's why it's at number 10, because I'm not a train geek. Over the years, there's been five versions of Railroad Tycoon, the last one in 2006. So it really has endured quite a long time. The aim of the game is simply to go through the country, which can be the United Kingdom or England to be precise, and the Northeast or the Western United States. Finally, continental Europe. You start off there with a million dollars and you have equity in the game. You can trade on the stock market and you can build bridges, tracks to your heart's delight. Just make sure you don't run out of money in the process. It's kind of Sim City, but for trains. Next up at number nine then is Stun Runner, which stands for Spread Tunnel Underground Network Runner. Really trips off the tongue, that one, doesn't it? Anyway, Besides the guff name, it's actually a pretty good game. It's 3D, it's a racing slash shooter game released in the arcades by Atari in 1989. This PC port in 1990 is still pretty good and the 3D graphics that alone um, were certainly quite revolutionary for their time. I really enjoyed this game. It wasn't one that I was aware of before playing it as part of the reviews of the year. The ultimate goal of the game is to go through the levels and pick up these stars and then go on to little sort of traps. I don't really know what they're called, but basically you've got to do it before your time runs out. So it's all time-based and it is quite a challenge to get over all the markers in time before you end the game. Before John Carmack and id Software were making Wolfenstein 3D and Doom, they were busy making a series of side-scrolling platform video games. This one is known as the Commander Keen series. The original series consists of six main episodes, a lost episode and a final game. All but the final game were originally released in 1990 and 1991. The series features our hero, an eight-year-old genius, Billy Blaze, as he defends the Earth and the galaxy from alien threats with his homemade spaceship, ray guns, and of course his pogo stick. Apogee released Commander Keen in the invasion of the Vorticons as shareware, and as per the shareware model, the first episode is distributed freely. This first episode, known as Marooned on Mars, is what you're seeing here. Billy's homemade ship has been ravaged by the evil Vorticon on his exploration to Mars. The aim of Marooned on Mars is to get your four vital components of the ship back. They are secreted across Mars. So to do so, you're going to have to defeat a host of Martians and robots, as well as Vorticon himself, who has the final component. Although Keen is just another scroller, what John Carmack and team did was clever. They made a technology called Adaptive Tile Refresh, a technique that allowed IBM-compatible general-purpose computers to replicate the smooth scrolling of video game consoles such as the Nintendo Entertainment System. The game's success caused designer Tom Hall, programmers John Carmack and John Romero and artist Adrian Carmack to found id Software. My biggest problem with the original Keen episodes is that they're a bit dull. Later Keen games had colourful, animated backgrounds, but the original static grey was a bit drab. Most of the rooms in the game are pretty much identical, just the layout and the baddies being different. This starts to wear fairly thin quickly, so I always ended up getting bored of the game. 
Keen is still a household name today. It has a cartoon, a succession of games were released through the 90s and into 2001. Another game has actually been announced in 2019 and is under development by ZeniMax Online Studios. Resolution 101 is a 3D action game set in a future New York City. The plot is novel enough. You're a criminal who has promised freedom if you help the authorities eliminate other criminals from the streets. In order to do this, you must take to the streets in your hover car and use the radar to track down and destroy the hover car of a designated criminal. After you destroy your opponent's car, you'll receive your award and move on to the more difficult missions, i.e. with more bad guys at one time. Your polygonal world is simple and the visual depth is not great. However, it is a very smooth experience for a game from 1990. The gameplay is somewhat repetitive and to some, it may be a controversial choice to be placed in the top 10. However, I enjoyed the game. It was fancy for its time, it was easy to pick up and play and the user interface was an inspiration for such games as Carmageddon and even The Terminator. Wing Commander is the first game in Chris Roberts' Wing Commander series, which ran until 2006. Wing Commander brought space combat to a level that felt like you were in the Star Wars movies. Set in the year 2654, it features a multinational cast of pilots from the Terran Confederation, flying missions against the predatory Kilrathi. Gameplay consists of completing successive missions and overall cockpit performance affects gameplay. Going above and beyond the Call of Duty results in medals, promotions and rank are awarded at regular intervals, and success or failure on certain critical missions decides the player's plot progress, winning or losing. You take the role of a pilot aboard the TCS's Tiger Claw, presuming that you perform well in the cockpit, you quickly rise through the ranks of the flight wing and eventually lead the strike on the Kilrathi High Command Starbase in the Venice system. On the other hand, if you didn't perform optimally, missions become increasingly defensive in nature and eventually the Claw is forced to retreat. For me, Wing Commander takes the logical step forward from games like Elite and lays down the foundation for games like TIE Fighter and X-Wing from LucasArts. At the time, it was stated to be five times more expensive to create than most of its contemporaries and that Chris Crawford was recorded as saying that it raised the bar for the gaming industry and increased the need to fund games with deeper pockets from then on. Wing Commander went on to win copious amounts of awards and reviews were always favoured it highly. The game was aged pretty well overall, however I often found myself underneath crafts when attacking. Orientation got the better of me sometimes, with the controls being a bit off-putting at times. Although, if you like space combat games, Wing Commander is a must-play. Also known as 4D Sports Driving, Stunts, is a 3D racing game. In this game, the idea is to race stunt tracks. It's important to note that this game is not intended to be a simulation, it's just good fun. It also features a track editor, which is a pretty neat feature at the time. It's clearly influenced by the earlier arcade game Hard Driving and has many similar elements to the game Stunt Driver, which was released the same year. In stunts, you race a lap around the circuit with the aim of completing the lap as quickly as possible without crashing. However, these laps often feature special track areas such as loops, jumps, including over tall buildings, slalom roads and corkscrews. You can either race against the clock or choose between six different opponents. There are 11 different drivable cars. Replays of the races can be saved and reviewed and I found myself guffawing just as much, or in some cases even more so, when watching the replays of my disasters. Much of this pleasure is caused by the fact that there are four camera views available. The cars can drive on paved roads, gravel roads, icy and snow roads, and grass if the driving is off track, which all offer different levels of grip. It was pretty clever for its time, it had an advanced physics engine, which can simulate oversteer and understeer. The grip is also proportional to the banking of a curve. It was well received and even years after it was released, 
it was still receiving awards. For example, in 1994, PC Gamer named stunts the 22nd best computer game ever. The editors wrote, the sense of speed and the degree of control that you have over your vehicle make this a must for every gamer. In 1991, Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat changed fighter games pretty much forever. However, before then, side-scrolling beat-em-ups were where it was at, and Golden Axe was one of the most mature, well-thought-out examples of side-scrolling beat-em-ups. I'd rate Golden Axe above Double Dragon and Bad Steep Ballers any day. As the game goes on, there's some reasonably intense action. It's not absolute madness. The pace gradually increases, and for that reason, it's quite rewarding. The fact that it's coupled with the choice of three quite different characters, Axe Battler, who looks like Conan the Barbarian with a haircut, and then there's Gilius Thunderhead, a dwarf armed with a battle axe, and, look, and last but definitely not least, Tyrus Flair, a female warrior that also looks a wee bit similar to Xena Warrior Princess. Your goal is to defeat the Death Adder, a nasty ball bag that's turned this once peaceful land into something that might reflect a night out in the wrong area of Glasgow if you had consumed a copious amount of magic mushrooms. Good old Death Adder has made your character's work cut out for you. You might have to fight your way through the stages filled with enemy barbarians or warhammered wielding giants, undead skeletons and a few more before you can come across that evil death adder. The combat itself is fast and responsive, there are a number of different moves and combos to learn. All of the characters can pick up magic potions, however not all of them can use them in the same effect. Axe, for example, looks like he's straight out of Chemistry 101. He needs a whole bunch of these potions just to let off a thunderstrike that kills all the baddies on the screen. Gilius here, by comparison, knows his P from his H. I also like the fact that you can jump on enemy dragons and breathe fire over the baddies, do jump kicks and bash baddies over the head with your weapon. The game is well supported on various different graphics cards at the time. Both the EGA and VGA versions looked pretty decent. The ad-lib music was nice touch, even if the sound effects were digitised through the PC speaker. Now, I mentioned the Bitmap Brothers in the last video, and if you haven't seen 1989 yet, then make sure you go and see it. Anyway, by the late 80s, the Bitmap Brothers were making some absolutely mind-blowing games. Mega Blast was an entirely different beast to 1988 Xenon. I mean, it wasn't even similar. They should have taken the name Xenon away from it because it almost felt like an embarrassment to associate it with Xenon 1. Not that Xenon was a bad game, it's just that Xenon 2 was so different and it surpassed it in every way. The premise of Xenon 2 is straightforward enough. There's not even an in-game backstory, just get on with shooting everything in sight, moving through the difficult to navigate pathways. Some of the pathways are completely unforgiving, they're just dead ends that you'll end up exploding in. Once you clear a stage, you'll be met by a fella that looks in no way similar to the ugly dude out of Predator. From here you can buy and sell wares. Be careful what you buy though, because some of it is pretty useless. I mean, there's power-ups you can get, but they'll cause you some sort of bonus like having a paltry 10 seconds of all gun goodness before ripping it all away and giving you a paltry pea shooter. Of course there are power-ups along the way, given as a reward for blowing up baddies to smithereens. I wholeheartedly recommend going after these power-ups as early as you can. Without them, you're just pretty much dead straight away. Did I mention you can die easily? Honestly, that is my biggest complaint with Xenon 2. Even with the good number of continue credits you get, it's just too unforgiving for someone who's not got the agility of a 14-year-old on Ritalin. The graphics consist of wonderfully detailed sprites, the scrolling is buttery smooth, and the conversion to the PC from the Amiga or Atari is pretty much spot on, with the exception of one thing, sound. As you can probably know, the AdLib card, the Game Blaster, and even the Sound Blaster were available to PC users in 1990. Xenon 2 only supports the PC speaker. Although the sound is cleverly made by pushing sounds that almost sound like it was digitized, Bomb the Bass's amazing soundtrack is just being paid lip service compared to how it sounds on the Amiga or ST. Here's a comparison. Amiga. PC. Amiga. What, 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 yeah. PC. 
The end game sound effects are even worse, blips and beeps for the most part. Why they didn't support sound cards is a mystery to me. I do appreciate the fact that the game supports all video cards, including the monochrome display adapter, and it will run on a stock XT fairly well, so kudos to those assembly line nutters for that one. All in all, Xenon 2 is a great game. I see its potential. I just wish I was better at playing it. When I said that the Bitmap Brothers were kicking it in the late 80s and the early 90s, I wasn't lying. This next game is another perfectly executed title from the Bitmap Brothers. Speedball came out in 89, and I reviewed it in the last top 10 too, and it was a great game on its own. Everything that Speedball did, Speedball 2 did better. The pace was faster, and you had teams of 9 instead of 5. There's also targets on the walls and on the floor that give you bonus points when hit. Talking about points, it's interesting to note that the same number of points is awarded for injuring a player as scoring a goal is. How evil is that? The evil doesn't stop there, however. If your player is injured, one of the three substitutes are put on on the playing area. If all of them are injured, then the first injured player is sent on again, wounds and all. You can choose how you want to play. There are five game modes, knockout, cup, league, practice, and multiplayer. Each game lasts for 180 seconds. Just like Xenon 2 before it, Speedball was graphically spot on, and unlike Xenon 2, it made use of ad-lib sound effects. Unfortunately, they were a little bit jarring though. Speedball is a formula that has been attempted over the years again, even as recently as 2013. Despite the follow-up games that came from different authors, they don't quite face up to Speedball 2. If 25th century soccer that allows you to beat the crap out of your opponents and play at an alarmingly fast pace sounds like your cup of tea, then Speedball 2 is the game for you. And finally, the game you've probably been waiting for, unless you hate adventure games, that is. The Secret of Monkey Island is a tour de force of excellence from Lucasfilm. I am an out-and-out -out Sierra Games fan, however, titles like Monkey Island, Day of the Tentacle, and Sam and Max are ones that will live forever on in my mind as Sierra game beaters. And that's a big call. If you haven't played Monkey Island before, you're in for a real treat. There's literally nothing I can do to fault the game. Well, actually, there's a really annoying bit with a lock in a shop and a path in a forest. Those kind of work like copy protection, which is annoying, but that's it. As a side note, the game also had physical copy protection too back in the day. It came with a cardboard rotating wheel that you had to match up the faces of pirates. I play the original EGA version on my XT and I think it still looks lovely. Although you're viewing the VGA version here, either way, the graphics are beautiful. Lucasfilm had a cast of artists work on their adventure games, and it really shows. Then there is the soundtrack. You're listening to the best version at the moment, the Roland MT-32. Every song that was in the game was atmospherically appropriate for the part that was in the game. Most are upbeat and a wee bit cheeky, just like the humour in the game. Which brings me straight on to that, humour. Humour is a mainstay for a successful adventure game in my opinion. As much as I liked Police Quest, it was a bit dry. I like the King's Quest series too, but again, they lacked the humour of Space Quest and Leisure Suit Larry. Sadly for Sierra though, Lucasfilm trumped them again on Monkey Island. The humour isn't so much slapstick, it's just laugh out loud funny. You also can't die, unlike the Sierra games. I remember the first time playing the game trying to defeat the Swordmaster thinking that I was going to die at any second as I just tried to defeat her with my witty words. I'd save the game relentlessly, just like I'd been used to with the Sierra games but that wasn't the way of the game. It was impossible to die, unless you stayed underwater for more than 10 minutes at one point. If you did, you got a nice easter egg window that popped up which looked identical to those in King's Quest when you died, obviously a direct jibe at Sierra. The puzzles in the game were never so hard that you'd end up bashing your head against the wall, and the game was split into three parts which gave you the feeling of accomplishment like finishing the chapters in a book. I could go on and on and on about this game for a very long time, but suffice it to say the characters are great, the plot is brilliant, the story is right, it's just the best game of 1990. And that's it for this top 10, I do hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please let me know in the comments and press like. 
If you fish around in my channel, you'll find lots and lots of lovely videos just like this one. And if you like them, then please subscribe to the channel. It makes me very happy and warm and fuzzy inside when you do. That's it for me. I will be back very soon. Until then, take care and be excellent to each other.